Yeah, that's totally what creative incubation is. You need time where you're not focusing on the problem because so much of creativity is drawing associations between things you never thought to connect before. And you can't like brute force that by like going through every possible connection of ideas in your mind. Like you can actually trust your own brain to do it. I mean, you're a creative, you write, you have to come up with ideas for these streams, which I know is a, a tricky task to just constantly be doing. Um, so I'm sure you know this as well, that like, it's when you step away from beating yourself up, up, like, I need to write something, I need to have this idea, and you're relaxed. I'm sure that's probably when your ideas actually just assert themselves to you, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, another thing that I'm really interested in now, um, for another book that I'm working on right now, is how much feeling safe is really needed for creativity. It's really hard for people to brainstorm when they feel like they're being judged. Oh, Dr. Price. Yeah. So in my brain, part of that is one of the reasons why people go, well, if people are homeless, then why don't they just do what they need to do to get out of being homelessness? Because you're unsafe and you're in fight or flight mode. And so mm -hmm. if you're in fight or flight mode, a lot of times these things where you can think in, in a more logical fashion kind of go out the window because you're so focused on survival that thinking, you know, ten, five, 10 years down the line, it just doesn't occur to you because you're just trying to survive to the next day. Introducing Dr. Devon Price. Wonderful to have you on the show. Hello, James. Hi. Thank you again so much for having me here. Thank you so much for all of the attention and care you've put into talking about the book. Um, everybody who's been in the chat too and leaving comments and, and reacting to it and sharing their own kind of take on it. I've, I've been watching as your reading series of the book has been rolling out the last few months and it just means so much to me. So I'm really, really thankful thank to you. be here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. And it is, I just want to say, um, I'm a firm believer in giving people their flowers while they're still alive. And I just want to give, you know, publicly a huge thank you to you for writing this book for you to uh, taking the bandwidth because I know it's a lot of bandwidth in order to be able to write such a book uh, because there's not just your thoughts it's also research that also went into this you know you have your notes that are in the book as well that went into the studies that were taught that were discussed uh, in this book and so I want to thank you for being so deeply involved into opening the eyes. And I, like I said earlier, to me, it's a love letter to those of us who are sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I just want to thank you for writing it. It has been a, an encouraging book for me to, to recognize my limitations as a human, but recognize that I am a human and to honor that too. So thank you. Mm, thank you so much. It's always really when you set out as a creative, you never know how things are going to land or if you really met the mark of what you're trying to do. And so it does mean so much to hear when it does reach people on that level. And and in the spirit of giving people their fly, flowers while they're here, I do also just want to, before we went live, uh, we were you and I were just talking together a little bit about just the the burden of education and, and learning and empowering each other to all learn together in a kind of anti-institutional way. Uh, as leftists, and it's just really important work that you're doing here, making a space for people to talk through these things that is incredibly accessible, both financially and for all of us with disabilities. It's just really meaningful stuff. And I know we can all feel sometimes a sense of doom or that we're not doing enough um, to bring in the kind of future that we want to see. And stuff like this really matters so much for forming community and empowering people to to envision a world not like this capitalist hellscape that we're in. So <laughs> you are in, you, look, you are home here. So thank you so very much. One of my first questions I would like to get into is because you wrote in the beginning as to why you wrote this book, but how has the process in writing this book helped you even further? If you can get into that just for a little bit. Yeah, that's that's an awesome question. Um, I interviewed a lot of different types of people in working for this on this book. I interviewed a lot of burnt out people. I interviewed a lot of therapists and coaches, typically ones who were a little bit 
you know, politically or socially aligned with kind of the message of where I was going in the book, but also people who just work generally with overworked and burnt out people. And I think in my writing, I feel like I am constantly still uncovering these stones in my own mind that have these like unwritten rules on them of the kind of person that I think I need to be or what I still need to be doing mm -hmm. with my time and my life. So even though I've already had that wake up moment that I talk about in the book of realizing I cannot work 60, 70, 80 hour work weeks, it's not gonna happen for me. I still have these little hidden, very powerful uh, self beliefs that, well, then I still need to do something really amazing and impactful with what hours of the week I do have, right? right. Or like, oh, I need to uh, be a presence in XYZ number of people's lives in a positive way and really show up for them and not let my needs kind of eclipse theirs. All of these kinds of beliefs that still get in the way of um, listening to my body, listening to my mind, being more attuned to my reality and my community, all of those things. Um, and I'd say too, the other thing that I, I, I learned over the course of writing the book is I got, I got even more radicalized over the course of writing it. Um, really? I thought, oh yeah, I think for me every year, I still get more radicalized. Um, nice, me too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're on that journey. So just yeah. as a quick example about it, I interviewed one person in the book who was, who for a brief time uh, owned his own uh, restaurant and was really working himself into illness while running that restaurant. And then after the book came out, I heard from somebody who had worked under him at that restaurant and I heard about all of the horrible things they experienced under that person. And it just really reminded me that, okay, even if I'm really sympathetic to the struggle somebody's going through and seeing them as an example of burnout and overwork, I still have to always keep the power structure at play in mind and remember to look to who has the least power in that situation. And so, you know, looking back at my old work, because I continue to progress yeah. I always look at what I would change and I think, oh, I should have talked to more bus boys. I should have talked to more line cooks. What was I thinking? You know? So there's little things like that. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, so the, the, the learning and the, and the growth is, is ongoing and the writing yeah. does really help with that. Yeah. As a former line cook, I know <laughs> exactly what that is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was uh, I, I went to culinary school in my last two years of high school and then I went into the industry and I worked in the industry for about six years before I got sick. So I know what it's like to be in that restaurant situation and there's definitely a hierarchy there that, you know, it's it's it, it can be deeply exploitative. So mm -hmm. I, I realize yeah. that. Yeah. Um one of the things that I wanted to touch on was in your, your book here um, is the introduction, the first paragraph. When I first read it, it was, it was almost like you're underwater and then that hand lifts you up by your collar and takes you out of the water. And it's like, yeah, you're not going to drown. You're good now. Um, and you said, I have a reputation as a productive person, but that reputation has cost me a lot. To the rest of the world, I've always looked like a put together, organized, diligent little worker bee. For years, I managed to balance professional success, creative output and activism without letting anybody in my life down. I never turn work in late. If I said I was going to be at an event, I'd be there. If a friend needed help editing a cover letter for a job application or moral support as they called their congressional representative about the latest human rights horror at the moment, I was available. Behind that veneer of energy and dependability, I was a wreck. I'd spend hours alone in the dark, overstimulated and too tired to even read a book. I resented every person I said yes to, even as I couldn't stop overcommitting to them. I was forever spreading myself too thin, dragging myself from obligation to obligation, thinking my lack of energy made me unforgivably lazy. You spoke to a ton of people. You you spoke, you're speaking about a ton of people in this country that have been, what's the best way to put it? That have been indoctrinated into thinking that you have to, be like a workhorse. And it kind of takes me into the, not to get into the religious aspect, but almost the uh, uh, 
the Judeo Christian type of mindset of you know uh, you work six days uh, six days out of the week and Sundays for church, you know, mm-hmm. and and it's like, can you tell me like what what uh, experiences since writing book have you met a lot of people who have your same experience that have came to you and talked about uh, that this is me, this paragraph is me. Yeah. I, you know, when I was first writing the book and getting it ready for publication, I thought about the people who would take issue with the book, who would argue with its premise. And I assumed it would be a bunch of kind of, if not ideologically conservative, kind of latently conservative people saying, no, there's lazy people out there. Donald Trump's lazy. My husband who doesn't help around the house is lazy. Da, 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 da. Instead, what I ended up hearing over and over again was people who would accept the idea of the book, people who were working ridiculously long hours, overextended with so many things, dealing with so many traumas, and they would turn to me and say, but this isn't true for me. Like, I I recognize myself here, but I still don't deserve to slow down. It's I'm still not doing enough. So that's been the thing that I've noticed time and time again in this work is just how hard it is to get people to internalize that, no, if you see yourself in this, this is about you. You are doing too much. You, you like all the rest of humanity, are a human animal with a body that needs to be taken care of, not a machine, not a cog that can just be plugged into a role and fulfill it forever. And you really do need to listen to that inner voice telling you that you need to rest. So, yeah, I do hear from a ton of people who read that introduction of the book and say, yes, oh my gosh, absolutely, I'm extended everywhere, but I can't stop. I don't deserve to stop. There's too much going on that needs my attention. Translating that like recognition into people really feeling some release and relief is, um, it's a struggle. I think think it's just that people need to hear it many, many times and really start to build a community that actually accepts them as they are imperfectly. Hmm. Like, oh my gosh, it's such a hurdle for people to get there. And myself too, you know. Uh, oh my gosh. There is this indoctrination, especially within the West, especially within the United States, where it's like, okay, perfect example. Every single time they somebody gets is interviewed that's successful, and I put that in air quotes, is the people who basically exploited their way to the top, right? You know, like the the great value Lex Luthor, Jeff Bezos, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, or you have the Elon Musk and people like that. Oh, I love to work, and I'm always working, and I want to be like bullshit. You're not. No, you're not. <laughs> no. Elon Musk is playing Elden Ring all the time and stuff. Come on, you know, yeah, fighting with people I, on Twitter. You no, know, there's no problem. You you don't work all the time. And then I'm gonna tell you, the people who say, "Well, I'm always working." No, you're not, because who's taking care of your kids right now? You got nannies taking care of your kids. That's one part of work that you're not doing. Okay. When it comes to cleaning your house, that's work that we also do that we don't get paid for. That's something you're not doing, okay? Mm -hmm. And then on top of it, who's who's going to the store for your food? You're not going – I don't see you at no Aldi shopping for for groceries. I don't see you at Save-A-Lot. So guess what? You're also not doing that work. So a lot of the work that you're doing really isn't really work. You're just exploiting and using other people's labor in order so that you can extract more time away from them for you to live your life and be lazy. So that's just one of my biggest gripes with the people who are like, oh, I'm always working. No, you're not. And then on top of that, if you're always working, then why do you have two, three, and four or five homes? Mm-hmm. What's the purpose of it? Yeah, yachts, vacation homes. Why do you need those vacation homes if you're always working? Mm -hmm. You know, like the the math ain't mathing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, (laughs) it it all comes down to what gets considered valuable work in this society and childcare, looking after people when they're sick. 
educating, you know, youth in an actually empowering way rather than just training them to kind of comply, just being out in your community, talking to people, these things that are just so essential, food, <laughs> keeping people fed. These are the things that if the government collapses, people will still show up and do because that's how humans stay alive. And it's because we have like a, a real human need to do them, you know, that is work. It's not me clocking into some academic meeting with a bunch of people who are making 100K a year, some university admin administrator just moving around budget lines. And it doesn't even, it doesn't help anyone. It doesn't bring anything into society. And that's, you know, at the level that, that I see on a university campus where we yeah. give all of our money onto administrators rather than these poor, like adjunct instructors who make like $3,000 a class. It's even more amplified. Again, yeah, when you look at the Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, um, yeah. the the work that is valued under the empire is just, you know, just sitting there in your status and lording it over people while the rest of us keep society yeah. running. Absolutely. Uh, and now I wanted to ask you this next question. What is one of the biggest issues you notice with people in combating the laziness lie? We're kind of venturing into that arena. What is one of the biggest issues you noticed? Because I know a, a lot of people are, a lot of people, like you said, they, they deny it themselves. Like they see themselves, but then they, there's this denial. But then um, there's many different chapters in the book that, you know, you talk about in regards to how we deal with family. Um, there's many different, you know, and one of my favorite ones was talking about society shoulds. Mm -hmm. um, and then you talked about, you know, knowing your worth. What are some of the biggest issues that you see uh, since writing the book? Yeah, two real barriers for people come to mind. The first one is one we talked about a little bit already, the really internalizing this stuff, giving yourself grace, coming to a point of acceptance, um, especially as, as many of us have disabilities that progress or we just become more disabled as we grow older, reaching a point of accepting that your life is what it is, that you're capable of what you're capable of, and you might never do more. You're probably only going to do less over the course of your life. And does your life, can you see your life as having value if you're never productive ever again? That's a really, yeah, yeah. It's it's kind of a grief processing in a way, you know? Yeah. People have to let go of a lot of thoughts that they used to have about what was important in their life and who they were. And almost having thrown that out, develop a whole new value system of how do I want to spend my days? What is meaningful to me? And that is really deep work that people have to really kind of meditate on. Yeah. Um, and I'd say the other big barrier people face is maybe they have kind of absorbed the message and they say, okay, I do want to work less and I'm going to pull back. There's all the systemic problems that prevent them from doing that. So I might decide I want to do less work at my job, but how do I do that in a way that I'm not going to get fired? And well, again, a lot of this draws back to community. It isn't just a question of willpower and self-advocacy, right? It is a it's a question of labor power. So a lot of times it goes from, okay, I'm gonna be easier on myself in my own mind. But okay, but if I actually want to make changes in my life, I'm gonna need to get together with my coworkers and we're gonna need to start a union at this Starbucks or whatever so that we can actually work at a humane pace. So translating the ideas into in practice action with other people. That's really hard, long work. And so I th that's where it takes people a lot of time to move through in stages, I think. Well, that that's a really great point, especially when it comes to systemic issues. And, and you know, one of the things I realized, especially, and this is in the black community, is that the laziness lie is extremely pro uh, prolific within our community because we, because the, the stereotype is, well, black people are lazy. They don't want to work. And then you got the welfare queens and things like that, that, that is tagged on in us just because of the color of our skin. And so what do we come up with to combat that hustle culture, right? I'm always working, you know, and, you know, I got two, three, four jobs and we're always trying to combat the, the white supremacist notion of, Oh, black people are lazy. 
when in reality, we are the furthest from lazy ever, especially given our, our ancestors and what they were put through because, you know, they were day in and day out for people that were too lazy to actually do the, the job themselves. But really, it's just a means of exploitation. And so when you go into that, it you, you start to feel like that part of the system and the system by it being capitalism, it, it conditions people in such a way where it's like, no, I need you to be a robot so that I can be a human. And mm-hmm. so it, it, it's, 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 it's a theft of other people's energy, other people's time and other people's resources in order to make yourself feel more human dare I say superhuman in a way is that am, am I kind of yeah kind of crazy? I, I think you're onto something because I, I even think here about how like white people in our culture are afforded more room to be vulnerable to be soft to have like a sensitive side and to talk about how they're working on themselves all of these things that come from white supremacy saying okay we're going to just build this nation on the backs of indigenous and black people and they need to keep going all the time, no matter what they're feeling. They need to show up to work no matter what. But if you're in the kind of white aristocracy under that economic power structure, then you can work on yourself. You can listen to your feelings. Oh. And so, yeah, it's really deeply ingrained to, and that's, I mean, that's where even like a lot of science fiction about like robots and and things like that come from. It comes from the history of enslavement and looking at how aspects of humanity were denied enslaved people under our economic system. And we're still doing that to this day. Um, And you see it within every organizational culture. Who's allowed to have emotions? The people at the top, you know, who's allowed to work at their own schedule? It's the people at the top and everyone else is supposed to just stifle so much of their humanity. Yeah. I wrote this and I I just wanted to, um, I'm making a statement here and I, I just want to see if you agree with this perspective. And I, and I think you do, but I just want to put this out there. In my notes, I say your book lays out the inherent flaws in a capitalist system and how it's unnatural for us as human beings. For example, when European colonial settlers came to claim the land, they noticed areas that seem unkept, but growing with fruits and vegetables. But in reality, the indigenous planet in accordance with the natural biodiversity to preserve the land while making it self-sustaining and productive. It would seem as that the indigenous already had the answer to the laziness lies centuries before. Would you agree with that perspective? I think so. You know, I am a big um, student of what our indigenous uh, peoples on Turtle Island have to teach us about this land and how to live um, in a variety of different ways. I was just reading um, Ruth uh, Dunbar Ortiz's An Indigenous People's History of the United States. Mm-hmm. Wonderful book, highly recommend it. Um, and in there she talks about how um, exactly what you're speaking about. The European colonizers came by and thought that they saw wilderness. And she says a lot of times what they saw as wilderness was land that for centuries had been maintained by indigenous stewards, but they had already needed to flee because of the encroaching colonization and these settler militias that were killing them. And so it was as if um, these Europeans stumbled across somebody's garden, somebody's backyard that had been abandoned for a few months or years because of a, a catastrophe and said, oh, this is wilderness. No, it wasn't wilderness. It was someone's home that had been very carefully planned and regulated with the three sisters, beans, corn, and um, pumpkin, squash, that cook, that grow so well together and are nutritionally complete and don't, you know, damage the land to all grow together. Like these things were very carefully thought out and understood. Um, But because they were bringing this European model of we need to have pastures for our sheep or whatever, they completely missed what productivity, if we want to talk about productivity, the land was giving by people who were living with it and of it and saw themselves as children of that land. And um, we're still living with that legacy today. 
uh, certainly with with climate change and how much it's changing our biosphere here in this country and everywhere else. Um, even the idea of what it is to be productive comes from this European industrial pattern. And it means we miss so much of the quiet work of maintaining communities, maintaining the earth that people want to do. I think people innately want to do that stuff when they're not alienated by capitalism from that labor. Yeah, definitely. What what do you say to people who retort with the laziness does exist and it's probably because you never found your purpose in life? I think we have to ask why there are so many people living today who they hate their job if they have one. They can't imagine a job that would make them happy. They find every facet of daily life to be an exhausting slog. If you think that that's a failure of human nature, you're really missing the big picture. Like, what are we doing to people in how we structure our spaces and our lives such that everything is so difficult and done primarily alone? This is not how humans have normally lived. Um, just as an example, I, I write a lot about disability. So you look at the struggles of people with ADHD and they get people with ADHD get pinned down as lazy, lacking motivation, lacking focus. They wouldn't get anything done if you didn't make them, blah, 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 these awful things. Mm -hmm. But if you look at most ADHDers, what they are is socially motivated. A mm -hmm. lot of ADHDers, if there's a pile of laundry that they cannot make themselves fold, if you sit in the room with them and talk to them while they're doing it, that laundry is folded in a second. We need other people to get things done. That's how humans work. We are motivated and enlivened when we feel like we are doing something meaningful or when we feel like we are around other people who recognize us and have our backs. And so if you like look around today and you see an epidemic of laziness, I think you are seeing a real like e epidemic of demotivation, but it makes sense. It makes sense that people aren't motivated when their labor is so alienated, when they're doing everything alone. We're social animals and we need to be together doing things that we actually believe in. Mm -hmm. to find yeah. that draw, you know? Absolutely. Uh, so uh, I'll save that last question till the end, but I want to get also into uh, this. So there's a couple of things, passages that I actually want to highlight as well in your book. Um, it's uh, chapter two, page 49. Um, I want to go over this really quick. And it's in paragraph uh, three. So it's laziness. So this is in your chapter, Rethinking Laziness. And it's under the subheading, Laziness is a Warning. And this was really strong and powerful for me because I was just like, man, this makes a lot of sense. So you say scientific research on topics such as productivity and burnout have taught us that there are limits to how much work a person can do. Those limits are more extreme than you might realize. For example, the 40 hour work week, which is considered quite reasonable and humane here in the United States, is still probably too long and demanding for most people. We are not machines. Our bodies and minds aren't set up to perform repetitive or mentally taxing work for eight or more hours per day. Still, many of us push through those limitations forcing ourselves to work harder and for longer than is truly healthy for us. How many people cursed you out for writing that? <laughs> <laughs> I, oh, I, so many managers I, and, and uh, CEOs and all of those people writing those Forbes uh, think pieces about how nobody wants to work anymore. You know, people need to return to the office, all that stuff. But like the most frustrating part is we have known this. The research has been here since at least the 70s. They have been doing productivity research, industrial organizational psychologists, in warehouses, in offices, in medical facilities, everywhere. And they find over and over again, people get most of their work done in a couple of hours. A lot of people, it's in their first couple of hours of the day. But, you know, everybody's different. Some people, they get all their work done at, you know, 2 a.m. People get that chunk of work done, and then they might try and force themselves or they might be forced by a boss nagging them or pressuring them. They're mm -hmm. staring at the computer screen. They're trying to just wring out those last few drops out of that wrung out rag. And it's yeah. it's not going to happen. 
And yet yeah. our whole, again, our whole economic structure is built around, we need to have people in these office buildings because we need to justify our investment in the property. And we need people buying lunches at these businesses. So they need to work a full-time day. They need to be there for eight hours or more per day. And then that generates so much more value to the economy because then they have to hire childcare. They have to commute and pay, get their car fixed up and all these things. There's entire industries that just rely on the time waste of dragging people into work when we know actually they don't need to be working and they're not getting any work done. Um, yeah. And anything I can do to shout that research off the rooftops until everybody realizes what we're doing is completely untenable and ridiculous, you know, I want to do. So yeah, thank you for highlighting that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it like one of the, one of the first things that I learned was when you highlighted this, this, this term called cyber loafing. And I was like, Oh, cause I'll be working and then I'll pick up my phone and start scrolling and looking at Facebook and Twitter or talking to my boyfriend or something like that. And next thing you know, it's like 10, 15 minutes past my, I'm like, Oh, I'm supposed to be working on doing a show or something like that. And now I go, I need to cyber, lo cyber loaf just for a little bit mm -hmm. because I realized that inherent need to stop and let my brain relax. Yes. You know, and so I, I appreciate that because I was just like, man, cyber loafing, that's what we do. And I know Savvy Savage, my comrade, she's in the chat because she has her own channel. And I know for a fact that when she's doing her research, she has to stop for a second just to, you know, the scroll through or, you know, talk on something. Or maybe even like I have this uh, this crossword puzzle uh, game on my phone that I may do. But that's really just a way for your brain to say, all right, 15 minute break, you know? Mm -hmm. so yeah. I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. We need that. We need time checking in with other people. Like, so, I mean, there's a lot of negative things to say so about social media, but there's nothing wrong. It's very human to have this impulse of, I've been working for an hour. This is a really kind of dry task. I just want to feel connected to somebody that I care about, tell them how my day is doing, share with them some annoying tweet that I saw online and we can bond over how annoyed we are by this thing. That's just like a fundamental human activity. Even something like just opening up a tab and, and shopping online a little bit, that means your brain's craving novelty. It wants to look at something interesting and novel. You're like a, you know, a zoo animal in your enclosure. You need some enrichment, right? You need activities. Um, you need empowerment that comes from playing a game and like completing the task in the game and saying, okay, that's satisfying. Now I can return to this really long task. Yeah. And yeah, so we beat ourselves up for it entirely too much. Mm -hmm. We really need that time. Yeah. There's another part in that same chapter of rethinking laziness. And it's under the, uh, the advice under laziness helps us be creative. Um, and you say, when we're able to rest and be lazy, we can learn new things about ourselves or have fantastic insights that would, we would ne never have occurred to us when we are focused on work. Psychologists who study creativity are often very interested in these big aha moments and have put a lot of effort into studying what a person can do to promote them. It turns out that laziness is one of the most effective steps to getting there. Mot moments of insight and creativity don't come by trying to force them. They require a period of mental inactivity. Good ideas often come to us when we stop trying to come up with them, such as when we're in the shower or in a leisurely walk. While it seems like these ideas have come out of nowhere, the truth is that our minds have become quietly and unconsciously developing them during our downtime. Psychologists call the productive downtime the incubation period, like an egg that must be kept warm and safe in order to develop into a healthy chick. The creative parts of our minds require safety, rest, and relaxation in order to produce unique ideas on insights. It's almost like a computer program where you have something working in the background, mm -hmm. right? But you don't see it working in the foreground, right? Is it kind of like that? Yeah, that's totally what creative incubation is. You need time where you're not focusing on the problem because so much of creativity is drawing associations between things you never thought to connect before. And you can't like brute force that by like going through every possible connection of ideas in your mind. Like you can actually trust your own brain to do it. 
I mean, you're a creative, you write, you have to come up with ideas for these streams, which I know is a, a tricky task to just constantly be doing. Um, so I'm sure you know this as well, that like, it's when you step away from beating yourself up, up, like, I need to write something, I need to have this idea, and you're relaxed. I'm sure that's probably when your ideas actually just assert themselves to you, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, another thing that I'm really interested in now um, for another book that I'm working on right now is how much feeling safe is really needed for creativity. It's really hard for people to brainstorm when they feel like they're being judged. Oh, Dr. Price. Yeah. So in my brain, part of that is one of the reasons why people go, well, if people are homeless, then why don't they just do what they need to do to get out of being homelessness? Because you're unsafe and you're in fight or flight mode. And so mm -hmm. if you're in fight or flight mode, a lot of times these things where you can think in, in a more logical fashion kind of go out the window because you're so focused on survival that thinking, you know, ten, five, 10 years down the line, it just doesn't occur to you because you're just trying to survive to the next day. And so that's part of that feeling safe in order for you to be able to turn your brain on fully. It, it, it just doesn't work that way. And so if we really want people to be more productive, then we also need to facilitate a system where everybody feels safe and people feel safe when they have structure, meaning mm -hmm. permanent housing, food, clean water, all these different things that are required. But the thing is, you cannot do it within the capitalist system because that requires exploitation and people's brains cannot work well when they're being exploited. Mm. Yeah. That's exactly it. People expect unhoused people to do all of this, you know, in psychology, we call it executive functioning, right? These skills of I'm going to make a plan for when I'm going to apply to jobs. I'm going to keep all my documents organized. I'm going to get a suit, all this stuff. First of all, economically, it makes no sense to expect that from someone who has, is working with nothing. True. But also exactly to your point, if you don't feel safe, you cannot focus, you can't plan and sequence a series of steps that you want to complete. And also you have very little reason to feel like you're going to make it through long enough for that to even pay off. Like if you're just worried about somebody taking your stuff or making you move, beating you up while you're sleeping, you're not going to think about even the long term of, oh, how am I going to, you know, get a, a job that I'm going to show up to for weeks and months. That's just not even on the table for people. And so, and we have a micro version of that with anybody who is overworked and exploited which is most people under capitalism, people are living just moment to moment. And that makes it, they don't feel safe. It makes it really hard for them to have insight into their own life, their feelings, how to improve their circumstances, how to uplift other people. And that's that's how they want us because then we can't envision a different way of building the world. It's the same way that like a cult, cult tactics 101, you don't let people get enough sleep. You don't let them get enough food because then they're not going to think about leaving you. Um, and that's kind of what we're doing as a whole yeah. economic system. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and then we're going into chapter three. Chapter three, just the title alone, I was, I was, it, it, it was, it, it was relaxing for me. It, it was almost like, okay, I'm not crazy. Your title of chapter three is you deserve to work less. And I want to highlight on chapter three on page 81. And this is the second paragraph under the subheading, you can only work so much. Human beings are not robots. When that first sentence right there, I'm like, yes, human beings are not robots. We can't keep churning out consistent results for hours and hours. In fact, we can't maintain consistent output for more than a couple of hours per day, like you just said earlier. People often find this startling to learn, but it is really true. We are not made to work for a full eight hours per day, despite that being considered the reasonable, humane workday length in much of the world. Though there's a great deal of social pressure and cultural programming that says otherwise, like I was saying earlier in the Black community, being productive and effective at work is not a simple act of will and determination. To do good work, a person has to rest and find moments to enjoy the beauty of life. More hours of work does not equal greater product productivity. That's because our attention and willpower have limitations and quality of work requires time for rest. This makes me think of 
those people who and, and, and typically it's a lot of the older generation, not all older people, but they'll say, well, if you want to really uh, save money and do better, then get rid of that Netflix subscription. Right. Stop getting that coffee, you know, at Starbucks. And then it's like, well, wait a minute. Number one, the money that we spend on a Netflix subscription is like negligible. Number two, that time that we're spending watching a couple of movies on Netflix is because we're working so hard that we need time to reset our brains and rest and get away. Mm -hmm. So it, it kind of feels like that. But if you want to touch on that a little bit about you can only work so much. Yeah, absolutely. Again, we think of it as if there's some just energy meter that humans have that you can just kind of pour out when really our ability to focus and do any activity is such a dynamic interplay of what our bodies are doing, what the environment is like in that moment, the nature of, of the goal we're trying to complete. And we just have no space right now for acceptance, I think, in capitalism yeah. that sometimes something's not going to work out. Sometimes you don't have the energy to complete something, or even sometimes a goal is just not a goal worth having. Mm -hmm. Just as an example, you know, I, I, at a university, even though we're people have ideas about what a university should be and is supposed to be. But a lot of times the people running it see it as we are selling degree programs. And so if there's a degree program and not enough people are buying what we're selling, not enough people are enrolling, there's this scramble to advertise the program, get more people in the program, make more money. There's never a moment where we just kind of pause institutionally and say, maybe people just don't need this. Maybe people don't want this. Maybe we can just say this was a failure and just let it happen, right? There's very little room for failure or learning lessons, just saying, oh, this didn't work. We're not going to grow forever. We're not going to turn a profit forever. Uh, capitalism by its nature seems unable to accept mm -hmm. loss, taking the L when you need to take the L, reevaluating, and also just listening to your body and saying, oh, no, I can't do this. I do need to say no to something. Because as much as I value all of these things that are on my plate, I can't do all of them. And I'm not a bad person for just noticing what's already true. You know, that's the thing. This stuff is already true, whether you acknowledge it or not. You have a limit. You can't be doing everything. Mm -hmm. If you're overextended, there are certain things that are not getting your best attention that might be the things that you really want to put your best attention into, whether it's your kids or, you know, activism, whatever it is. There's only so much energy that you have, and you really cannot yell at yourself to make yourself have more energy. That's just never going to work. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, speaking of energy, um, in chapter four, it's entitled Your Achievements Are Not Your Worth. And you go over some of the things. Uh, one, of, one of the things that I actually appreciate was how to reframe your life's value. And then you talk about these things like learning to savor um you, you actually made an example of if you're eating if you're watching tv or if you're you know working while you're eating you actually don't get a chance to really savor what you're having to really enjoy what you're having so i i liken it to i had some bomb ass soup today before <laughs> this stream <laughs> I had some great chicken noodle soup, but I was working and doing stuff while eating my chicken noodle soup. But really, I should have went to the table, sat down and enjoyed my soup. Mm -hmm. But I didn't because I was so focused on trying to make sure that things got done. When in reality, taking the time to actually savor, which is uh, something that we should be doing as humans, we don't do as much anymore. It's more... We just eat to just keep our bodies going so that we can continue to be productive, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're yeah. so dissociated from the world and our bodies. It's like we're not living in full color. We're like living in black and white. Yes. Because we're just – and I struggle with this too. Even though I, I, I care about this stuff and I try to improve it, I have to really notice myself – oh, I'm supposed to be taking a walk right now and enjoying this beautiful Lake Michigan that I live by. And I'm thinking about an email that I need to write, or maybe I'm pausing on the trail and writing the email. Why am I doing this? Or even something like documenting it. Why am I doing that? Am I trying to look like I did something productive because I made content for the internet or whatever? Like there's always this wall between us 
and the experience. And it's, it has to be a really conscious choice to say, no, I am going to actually just like, I'm going to touch this tree and feel the bark and remember where I actually am. You know what I mean? And yeah. savor the soup and all of these things. Um, even something like the cyber loafing example that you gave before, I could be mad at myself for pausing for my work to text a friend or a loved one or a partner, or I could say, no, I need this. And this is like the stuff of life <laughs> connecting with people we love about love. Why, why can't I just like appreciate this moment of connection and things like that? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then learning to savor and then make time for all um that was great because that made me think of grab a blanket put it on the grass and look at the clouds mm -hmm. just do that or or if it's at night and you can see stars look at the stars just chill you know and just look at because we live on a beautiful planet take time to look at your planet or if, if there's a parade Go ahead and take time to look at parade. And the funny part is we're so busy at shows and parades going like this. Mm -hmm. And it's like. Look with your eyes, not at the screen. Anyway. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and then you go over, do something you're bad at. It's, it's, it's great because it's like, it doesn't like, even if you suck at it, keep doing it. You'll improve eventually. And it's just like, oh, there's this guy, he teaches calisthenics. And he said, the goal isn't to be an expert in one day. It's the consistency of it. You may only be able to do, you, you may, instead of being able to do pull-ups, you may only be able to hang on to the handlebars for five, 10 seconds. That's okay. Try for 15 seconds next time. Try for 20 seconds next time. And then as you get, as you progress and keep it consistent, you'll get better. But it's okay to suck, mm -hmm. right? That's something yeah. I learned. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah. It's it's okay to suck. Not everything we do needs to be something that is a value add. There's so much value to frivolity, to being silly, to doing something that has no other purpose other than doing the thing felt good or taught you something new or just gave you a di another different view of reality, a different peek into another aspect of the world. Mm -hmm. um, I think sometimes we don't, we lose the skill of how to learn, you know, yeah. like learning itself is a skill. Being bad at something is a skill. Like it takes a lot of presence and humility to just do something that's uncomfortable. And that's really important for us. Yeah, like me starting out on this channel. <laughs> <laughs> Did was it a struggle at first? Because <laughs> oh, all your overlays look so nice now and everything. Oh, so well, I would not well, it took a lot of lessons. And look, you know, my, my homie Savvy, she will tell you she I, I learned a lot from her. And so, you know, I I I there's a lot of there's a lot of there's a lot of uh content that I took off the channel in, in way in the past because it was just like Dude, what were you thinking? That's what I'm saying to myself. <laughs> I I do some uh, Twitch streaming. Um, we should have you on the show, also. I should say, oh, cool. and um, some of the early videos, I didn't understand how anything worked. Like my video was so choppy. Like the chat was like in a weird place where nobody could read it. You know, but like I learned so many technical skills from just doing it. If I had waited until I had the setup perfect before I started going live, I never would have done it. You know, I don't know if you're the same way, but I had to build the ship and my producer, Maddie, who's way better at the technical side of things. We had to really build the ship as we were flying it, you know, and that's fine. Like, that's how you learn. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I totally get that. Um, chapter five is titled, you don't have to be an expert in everything. <sighs> I suffered, especially in the first beginnings of me in this space, whether I was doing RBN, well, we used to be Fred Hampton left us before we turned, ch uh, changed name to RBN. I suffered from imposter syndrome like crazy in the beginning because I was surrounded and I'm still surrounded by brilliant people. And I felt like everybody knows so much more than me. 
And why am I in this space? Like, why did you guys pick me? And so feeling like I had to be an expert in everything, it really hit because it's like, you don't. And I, and, and this is something I tell, especially to women, because un, unfortunately, a lot of us men, we tend to have like ego. And so we don't have to be an expert in everything. We'll just, you know, fake it till we make it. But I notice what a lot of women and by, by women, I'm, I'm talking about cis women. Um, a lot of times they'll feel like, well, they have like 90% of the facts on a subject, but that 20% will prevent them from coming on camera to talk about it. And I'm like, why? You have 80% of the facts. You know more than that uh, than that dude that only has like 20, 30% of the facts, you know? But a lot of times we end up downing ourselves because we don't know everything, you know, down to the mi most minute detail, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think the powers that be, the po existing power structure really benefits when we censor ourselves or mm -hmm. when we create a, accidentally or on purpose a culture of you can't speak at all as you're still figuring things out. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, you see it all the time, women being silenced and spoken over. I mean, it, it happens to trans women too, even within the trans community, trans men talk yeah. over trans women and say, you know, no, we're, we're the authority on the experience in our, in our uh, mm -hmm. realm as trans people and, uh, and tell trans women, you know, like, oh, um, you know, you, you can't speak up or you're being too aggressive. Like the same things that happen also to black people in the workplace, for example, of just don't use okay. that tone, whatever, the censoring. Yeah. Uh, there's so many marginalized groups of people who, you know, the less power that you have in society, the more people tell you to just shut up and to doubt yourself. Unfortunately, it is those people who have the most insight into how often how these systems work and, yeah. and so much to contribute. And, um, and yeah, we just all get, whether we're disabled, whether we're trans, whether we're queer, everything, the more layers of that you have, the more ways that you've been silenced. And it skews all of the conversations that we're having and that we don't get to have because those people aren't heard. Yeah. Oh, yes. That facts. Like the young kids say, facts. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, there's another point that I wanted to point to that I also wanted to get to. Uh, chapter six um, in Your Relationship Should Not Leave You Exhausted. Uh, page 164. Um, you talked about uh, page 164. Uh, say no to small things. Um, it said, you said it takes time to ret retrain a person and adjust their expectations. It also takes time to train ourselves to stop reflexively saying yes to so much. Kathy finds it often most effective to begin with small refusals particularly ones that won't blow up into a huge conflict. Start by saying no to small things, she says, because those are easier and the consequences are less. Start, start to notice when the demanding person asks for something small, like getting a ride to the airport, and just start to say no to some of those things. As somebody who it was very difficult for me saying no throughout my life, no is the hardest two-letter word for me to ever say. And this suggestion here is to start small with small requests and say, no, really helps because then you start to realize your own power in that way, you know? And so I just, you know, thank you for that one. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that one up. Just yesterday I was um, on a podcast that's for um, sexual violence survivors and uh, the host, uh, Katie Costner, she was talking about that same exact same piece of advice. And she said that that actually has a term in a lot of um, survival recovery spaces of basically just being an aspect of helping people develop agency again. Like if you have people who are, are victims, survivors of sexual violence, they feel really unempowered. And so just learning to say no to just little things like, can you turn that radio down? I really don't want to hear any music right now. Like, no, I don't want to talk about this. Just little rejections help people develop a sense of being in control of themselves again. And again, if you've been marginalized, if you've been spoken over or tone policed all your life because of your identities or your position in capitalism, 
you really have to develop that sense of, no, I actually can assert my point of view in the world and I don't need to exist for other people all of the time. Like that happens. I, I certainly hear this from a lot of my black comrades that people think that they just exist to meet other people's needs and even resolve other people's conflicts for them. There's just this labor taken out of you that people feel entitled to and attention all the time. And just being able to say no to that. And at first you will, I think most people feel distress. You feel bad saying no. So you say no to something small. You ride out that guilt and realize the world did not end. I'm not a bad person. I needed to do that. And then you're better positioned to say no to bigger things in the future. And it's a slow process, but I think that is a really good place to start. Yeah. It's powerful. Uh, it's powerful to assist people into realizing their own autonomy and exercising their own autonomy. Because a lot of times when you're when that's taken away from you over and over you start to get used to it and then you start to give your autonomy over because you expect it to happen mm. you know yeah. and um and then it's like you feel like if you don't give it over then there's something wrong with you when in reality it's not something wrong with you. It's something wrong with the system. Yeah. You know? yeah. So yeah, uh, trying not to get teary eyed here, but you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yeah. it's it's part of building a future world too. You know, like we have been so conditioned uh, to comply under capitalism and to think that we need a president, to think we need the cops, to think we need a boss. Yeah. And if we want to overthrow that power structure in some way, we all have to get more confident in our own strength as people to decide what's best for us, that we actually don't need those authorities over us and that yeah. we can trust our neighbors too, you know, that we can trust other people, that they don't need the cops looking over them and controlling them either or our boss or president, whatever. Yeah. Um, and so it's this is it starts really small, but I think it is so crucial to – building any kind of leftist movement is people being empowered and feeling capable and knowing that we can take care of ourselves and each other and our communities mm -hmm. and that we yeah. have a lot more power than we realize a lot more strength yeah. than we realize. Yeah. Um, and uh, just a couple more things um, on um, shrugging off society should under the subheading uh, page 192, it says your life can be messy. Says another damaging should the laziness lie promotes is the idea that our lives should look a certain way. The competitive nature of capitalism leaves many of us feeling that we have to attain a certain kind of lifestyle, one that impresses other people and signals our wealth and success. This is yet another trap and another needless source of stress. The phrase keeping up with the Joneses comes from the title of a com comic strip by author Pop uh, Moment and published first in 1913 in the New York world. And then it talks about the McGinnis family and the keeping up with the Joneses and the pressures to maintain this classy presentable lifestyle to impress people around them. And it's like, you, you feel like if your lawn doesn't look a certain way, right? It, it, like for instance, uh, and bringing this back to, to race again, um, the way our hair grows out of our scalp is sometimes seen as distracting. And it's like, well, this is how it grows out. And so society should is, is based on a system that wants to keep us within a box, whereas that's not how humanity is. That's not how humanity is. You know, and so just if you wanted to comment on that, I just I appreciate that part too. Yeah. I think it just fosters again, even more compliance, right? Um, I'm, I'm reminded again in your comment of just parallels between uh, misogyny and anti-blackness here. And when you, yes. when you look at misogynoir, it's, it's, it goes, runs even deeper. 
you know, women are told that they need to put all of this meticulous effort into their appearance in order to be allowed to exist in public life. Black people are told that they need to do all kinds of things to their hair, to their presentation, to erase aspects of their culture and how people talk in their culture in order to be professional or to be, again, able to participate in public life. And when you're investing that much mental energy and money and time into your presentation, that is time that is not yours. Um, it's, it's time that keeps you feeling self-conscious. If anything's out of place, that makes you worry about how people see you and how they're evaluating your status. And it ex extends to other things too. Like, you know, I need to have this fancy car. I need to have this kind of lifestyle that affects, kind of affects everyone, but it falls the most heavily on people who are marginalized and these structures of power. And, um, you know, it, we're, we're both disabled. I think it also comes down, a lot of disabled people feel a lot of shame if we have a messy house or we have to wear pajama pants to the Zoom meeting <laughs> these things that we have to do to just manage our like pain and exhaustion yeah. and that can keep us out of the game then it keeps us from sharing our perspective and so it really um, reinforces the Dr. Price why well, you got to call me out with the pajama pants <laughs> <laughs> because I have been there <laughs> I ain't standing up right now um, so <laughs> but uh, I have one more question if that's okay with you yeah um, and this is one of my more deeper questions that I would like to ask of you as somebody that's on the left, like myself, what do you think is the best systemic solution to combating the laziness lie? Oh gosh. At the time that I wrote the book, I had certain ideas in mind and I mentioned some of them in the book, things like universal basic income and, and things like that. But as I mentioned, as time goes on, I get more and more radical. Mm -hmm. um, and I think especially just uh, what's been the genocide is, is just another further radicalizing moment of, of losing faith in the existing systems that we have. Um, so I, I don't want to cop out and say, you know, dismantle capitalism, no more U.S. government. But I kind of that kind of is what I think at wow. this point. <laughs> it would be nice. Um, <laughs> I, yes, we can try. But I do think we are kind of in a moment now where something has changed in the air. It's become a lot more normal for more people to talk about this entire system. We can have no faith in it. And you know, the people who are engaging with this system right now and thinking about, you know, third party candidates, local elections, I don't want to pass any any judgment against that because anything that gets more people housed and fed in the immediate term is is beautiful. And that means we have more comrades who are there and can carry on and live to fight for a better world. So I don't want to discount any of those things, but um, it all goes back to settler colonialism. It really does. And I think the answers for how to take care of people, regardless of their ability level, regardless of their age, for us to have to derive wisdom from our elders without having one elder be like pumped full of drugs and be carted around as like the symbol of America the way we have now. The models for how to live were here on this land and indigenous peoples on other continents. Lots of there are other ways of living. And I, so I, again, I, it feels like a little bit of a cop out to say, but I think, I think we are many of us realizing that we can live a different way, a really yeah. radically different way. And there is no reforming a, a nation state that has done this much evil and continues to. And I think what happens next from that realization is up to each of us. And, you know, the choices we can make again, to help keep people housed and fed and as strong as they can be yeah. to get to that hereafter, you know? That was a heavy <laughs> question and you definitely lift, bro. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so thank very you. much. Uh, Dr. Price, can I have you back on to talk about like news stories and things like that, uh, you know, just to cover a topic or two in the future? Yes, that would be my pleasure. Absolutely. Definitely. And uh, just to let people know, like, where can they find you? What do you have coming up next, too? Yeah. Um, so I uh, 
I have a book coming out next year. I've already written one book about um, autism and it's kind of a follow-up. So that'll be coming out uh, in March. And I just post writing for free really regularly on my Substack, which is just drdevinprice.substack.com. So the piece that just came out uh, yesterday was a piece on harm reduction and suicide. How do you support people who are feeling suicidal in this moment and uplift their autonomy without calling the cops on them? Um, so that's what I've been working on lately. So, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Price. It is an honor and a privilege to have you on. And I just want to thank you once again for this book. This book has meant a lot to me. It's literally one of my favorite books. And I recommend it to wherever I can, especially those of us who are workers. And I wish you all the success uh, and, you know, peace and liberation that we all deserve. And I can't wait to have more conversations with you in the near future. Yeah, it's it's been awesome. Thank you so much for having me on, James, and everybody for, for being here for this conversation. I really enjoyed it a lot. Yep. Thank you so very much, sir. All right. Talk to Take you soon. Care. All right. Bye. Bye. Thank you so very much for watching my channel, and I deeply appreciate it from the top and bottom of my heart. If you wish to support the channel further so I can keep bringing you content that is educational and informative, you can become a patron on patreon.com forward slash jbfond. You can find that link in the pinned comment or in the description below. No matter what you give, you'll be supporting independent media and education that helps make the world better. Thank you so much. And you can watch more of my content here. Mwah. Forehead kisses and have a beautiful day.